But um, this is something I wrote for this sermon, and I just want to, first I just want to sit down, just kind of relax a little bit. Um, uh, the title of this is, Have You Ever Wondered Why? Have you ever wondered why? As I sit reflecting on my purpose in life as a leader, I begin to think of my purpose, vision, and how it, defi- how it directs my passion. It makes me reflect back to those times in my life when my vision wasn't clear. I lost purpose and passion in those things of God. So I began to ask myself why this was. What I concluded is that I was looking at myself instead of looking at Christ for my purpose. My vision became unclear until I put my eyes on Christ. Clarity came to me once again as I started walking in the purposes of God. I learned it is not about me, it is about God. And I think that's so important to understand it's all about God, not me. When I began to lose focus and lose vision, I realized that um, I'm thinking about myself or, you know, it's all about me. It's not about me. It's all about God and what God's gifted me and, and to do. And the name of this uh, title of this message is Living on Purpose as Leaders. And it's a declaration statement. I want us to repeat this. I will, I will live, as a leader live as a leader on purpose. On purpose. Amen. I think we need to learn that. We are all leaders at some level. Um, we lead at some level. And we are, all need to live on purpose. Because purpose, having purpose is important. If you don't have purpose in life, you know, things don't always look great, do they? You've got to have that purpose in your life. And the text is Proverbs 29, 18. And this is a familiar scripture. We could probably say this by heart. Twenty nine eighteen. Where there is no revelation or vision, if you have the NSAB, or there's some some versions have prophecy uh, or prophetic words. I think there's one at the in, in the New English version. I think something like that, prophetic word or something like that. Revelation: the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the the law. So where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. So what does that look like to you? Just think about that visually to yourself, where there is no restraints. So you're lacking something there, aren't you? Where there's nothing there, you have no vision, you have no passion, you have no purpose, you have no restraints, you're just kind of on the go, on the loose, amen? And so we gotta have that knowledge and we gotta have that revelation, otherwise we'll run wild. And this this is kind of a bad model for leadership. Um, I look at this more as a leadership model where you're leading somebody and you got to lead them with purpose and you got to lead them with passion and a vision as well. And so you got to have all those things. So I want to, in my introduction here, purposeless groups fail, leader groups also fail, and small groups need direction. Purpose and leadership. There can be multiple leaders in a small group, but there cannot be a healthy group without leadership. And leadership gives direction and meaning, and direction and meaning roll out of God's covenant life. And that's from GW. And I'm not going to pronounce his first name because I think it's French, and I'm not really good at French. I never get used to getting French, though, because where we're going. Um, So purposeless groups fail. You see that? If you don't have a purpose, groups will fail. If you don't have a direction of where you're going, they will fail. You've got to have leaders leading other leaders, in a sense. Like pastor is the head of this group, and we have leaders underneath him that lead other areas. That's kind of the same, the kind of the thought. If pastor didn't have a purpose or a direction for us, then what use do we have? We, we look at ourselves as an apostolic church, so that's our purpose. Right. That's our destiny, and that's our identity is a, as an apostolic church. But if we didn't have that on us, then we would have no purpose in why bother what we're doing. You know, we would just be full floundering all over the place trying to figure out what we're doing. You know, so we've got to have somewhere. We've got to have a direction where we're heading. I like to know where I'm going. Um, I'm the kind of person that, you know, I like to map things out. I like to have everything in order. 
I'm very task oriented. And if yeah, my wife could attest to that, I get very cantankerous when my task gets affected. Um, I'm very schedule oriented. And so my, my whole day is scheduled out. So I have a purpose for that day. Uh, so if he messes up my schedule, you're in trouble. No, <laughs> I'm a very cranky person then. No, just kidding. Praise God. So as leaders, we need to learn to lead with purpose. She over there, sharing you on. So as leaders, we need to learn to lead with purpose. Without the purpose, people go astray. People go all over the place. Without purpose, we have no hope. Have you ever heard people say, or I've said this too, what is my purpose in life? What is my purpose in life? Have you ever said that? I've said it. Um, especially in my younger days, I go, what in the world am I doing here? What is my purpose in life? What is meaning for life? Because I always looked at myself as never really gifted or really never talented. You know, I've always seen, you know, gifted and talented people always seen them up front, you know, but behind the scenes, there's gifted and talented people behind the scenes as well. Like, like hospitality, that's super important within the church. That is super important in the church. I mean, you're not about you see, but that's a gift. God's given some of you. Hospitality. Those are some of the gifts that God's given. Um, like greeting at the door. That, you know, there, uh, those are part of hospitality, but greeting and things like that. Those are all important aspects. There's a lot. I think the majority of the things are behind the scenes than in, than in front. Very rarely. I mean, this is, you might see the people up here that are gifted and talented. But behind the scenes, there's a lot more. I, th I believe yeah. um, we need like administrators. That's a gift and a talent. Um, we might not see that that way, but that is a gift and a talent. And it's just important. We we all work together as a team. That's what we're all here for as a team. There's no I in this place. It's all team. <laughs> it's all teamwork. Okay. Uh, living on purpose is intentional. You have to be intentional living on purpose. You have to be intentional about it. And this is my definition of living on purpose. Living on purpose is discovering the inner person of who you are. You're discovering the inner person of who you are as a person. Uh, that, that person who you are inside. It's not the outside person, it's the inside person that needs to come out. And that's what living on purpose is about. That inner person to come out of there. Um, so if we're just discouraged and saying, what is my purpose in life? You know, we're, we're, we're not, not, what good is that going to do us? You know, I mean, we could live a life of what ifs. But I don't want to live a life of what ifs. I want to live a life of purpose and have meaning. Um, I might mis make mistakes. I might fall down. But that's okay. We can pick ourselves back up. You know, successful people weren't successful overnight. I mean, if you look at successful people, they had a purpose, they had a vision, and they had passion. And they failed. I don't know how many times. You could look at different people, how they failed. Um, and that's something I do a lot is I read books that our biography is of people that failed, like Einstein. We think of, the, we could look at the end result of his life, but many people, if you read his biography, many people um, rejected him, didn't, didn't, didn't accept him at all. He ended up in a mail room for the majority of his life working in a mail room, Einstein did. They wouldn't even have him as a teacher for a while in a, in a college. And that's what his, one of his passions was, a teacher in a college. Not until later in his life did he, was he able to do that. You know, that's amazing to me that we'll see the end result of his life, but if you've really been to study his life, you know, he looked at it as a failure in his, in his way, but he didn't let that stop him, though. He didn't, let, he didn't let that stop. He had a passion to teach in a college, and he eventually did toward the end of his life, but the majority of his life, he worked in a mailroom. Um, look at Bill Gates, you know, where he's at now. They, him and uh, Paul Allen, they worked in a garage for a long time, and, uh, you know, they had a purpose to make software. They were nerds. But they had a purpose. And look what they're at now today. They didn't let it stop them. You know, I, could, I go on, on and on about different people that I know that are successful that, that looked at life as, as they thought. Or they were, as people would think they were failures. There also has to be a vision and passion that are part of being leaders of purpose. So we have to have vision and passion as well. And then the first thing we want to talk about is purpose. This is the direction you're headed with God. It is his design for you. Have you ever um, just got into a car and just start driving? 
I'm not one to do that. I have to have a purpose where I'm going. I have to get in a car. I have to go to, if I'm going to the store, I, know, I need to know what I'm going to get at the store. I'm not going to go there just to go shopping. I don't like shopping. It's really rather boring to me, going shopping. Um, <laughs> but for me, it's boring. I've got I to gotta have a purpose why I'm going to the store. If I've got to go get milk, I'm going to go get milk, and that's all I'm going to get milk at the store or whatever. Um, you know, I've got to go somewhere. If, you know, that's what purpose is about. Is I'm going somewhere. I'm heading somewhere. You know, I've got, I'm going, I know what I'm going to go get. <laughs> and I like this, what uh, in Colossians 1, 15 through 18 says in the message. It's um, a little bit different than, if you, you might have a hard time following along, so I had it put up on the board. Um, we, look at the, we look at this son and see the God who cannot be seen. We look at his son and see God's original purpose in everything created. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. He was there before anyone of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. And when it comes to the church, he organizes and holds it together like a head does a body. I like that idea of, really gives you that idea of um, God created everything for purpose. Like Helen was saying tonight, we were singing that song that kind of goes right along with that, um, uh, what we were talking about, right along with what you were saying. I was going, wow, God is just speaking about that. You know, that's kind of cool. That he designed us. He designed us on purpose. Each one has a gift and a talent to share with somebody. You know, if you're holding that gift and talent back, that's not right. You're, you're being selfish with it. And I'm just being up front with you. Is that okay? <laughs> I thought, um, but to me, it's being selfish if you're not sharing your gifts with others. That's what your gift and talents are for, to bless others. Whatever your gift and talent is, you know, you got to find that in, your, in you. Um, and actually, they say that your gift, your gifting or your talents is actually what you're doing already. Sometimes it's so easy, you don't even realize you're doing it. Um, but that needs to be shared with others. Some of us, you know, we need to be sharing that with others. And so God, isn't that neat though that God designed us for his purposes? Just think about that for a minute. God designed us for his purposes. I mean, that's just phenomenal. That he wired us and designed us just for, a, for this moment of time in our life to minister to others for him. Isn't that cool? How, think about that for a minute, how he designed that, how he did that. I think that's just awesome. It just kind of mind boggles me. So it's not about you. The purpose of life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It is far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you are placed on this planet, you must begin with God. You were born by his purposes for his purpose. That was Rick Warren um, from Purpose Driven Life. Just think about that for a minute, what he just said there. It's not about you. The purpose of life is far greater than your personal fulfillment or your peace of mind. It's, it's way beyond you. You have to start with God. You can't, like I said earlier, it's not about us. It's about God. You know, sometimes we want to do everything on our own strength, but it doesn't work that way. I've tried that before a few times, and I fell flat on my face. Um, something I discovered is I've got to be uniquely me. I might not be the best, you know, this or best at that, but that's okay. God created me for what he created me for, and I just got to walk in that. You know, I, uh, you know I'm not, I might be the best speaker, but that's okay, God. But God still has me doing what he needs me to do. You know, um, it's kind of funny for me standing up here because I would never see myself doing this before. Uh, you know, I'm kind of the shy, quiet type, you know. But God's got a sense of humor, I think, like somebody said over here today, <laughs> Lloyd. Uh, God got a sense of humor. He puts people in places where you didn't think you'd be. And he equips you and wires you, and you just got to flow with that. I remember my first sermon I preached. Oh, my Lord, I feel sorry for the people. <laughs> my, my wife could attest to that one. I was a nervous wreck. I mean, goodness gracious. Stubber, stuttering and, you know, just, every, I mean, this is a horrible mess. But God's brought me through the process, you know. 
Um, and I had to learn to, to, to talk in my own way. So I used to want to emulate everybody else. You know, I might not be the you know, loudest or you know, whatever. That's not me. I'm very, you know, I'm speaking through how I talk. I'm, I'm very, you know, like to teach. I like to teach, and that's kind of how I, my, my style. Um, I'm not going to be spitting on you all and <laughs> throwing things at you, but, that, but I'm, I'm, I've, learned, I've learned to walk in my, in <laughs> but I learned to walk in how God created me, and, and that's what living on purpose is, learning how to walk in what God created right. you right. instead of trying to be somebody I'm not. And I tried to be somebody I'm not, and it didn't work. I fell on my face. It was just, it was just too uncomfortable. I can't be a TD Jakes, okay, man? Get ready, get ready, get ready. No, you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I, mean I don't know where that came from, but that's okay. It was, it was extra. Uh, my sense of humor comes out, too, if you notice. I love making people laugh. You know, that's kind of my point thing. You got to laugh, man. All right, who did this? Norton over there. <laughs> Don't start. Uh, well, life is, uh, life is too short not to be serious. I mean, what do you want to be serious all the time for anyway? I mean, goodness gracious. My goodness. I've already done enough depression in my life. Man. I'm getting over that stuff. Amen. It doesn't start with us. It starts with God. Amen? God's the one that, like it says here in Colossians, it starts with God. God created us for purpose. And most people tend to limit, this is Kevin Cushman. This is kind of where my message went off is from his book. I really like this book on leadership. It's called Leadership from the Inside Out. And it's a really good book by Kevin Cushman if you want to read that. Um, I recommend it. Uh, most people tend to limit purpose by viewing it only as something external. To really understand the value of purpose, we need to drive beneath the surface. So we need to get down deep inside of us to find out. That's, what I, that's, my, uh, that's probably where I got my definition from. Living on purpose is discovering the inner person of who you are. So getting down deep inside of you, panning that gold, getting that gold out of you, basically, getting that good stuff out of you. You know, we got to get the good stuff out of us. So many times we live on the surface instead of inside, what's inside of us. We view and we, we, we view a lot of things from the external, from the outside, instead of the inside of, of a person. That's where the beauty of a person is, is in the inside. Yeah. The beauty of a person is on the inside. It's not the outside, but so many times um, we view people from the outside of how they look, how they act. If they're very charismatic and they're going up for a, a presidential election, <laughs> like in a school, okay, like, like in a school, <laughs> usually, the char usually the charismatic ones you usually, if you notice like in high school or whatever, it's usually with the charismatic one that gets elected. Yeah. I remember when I first went to Eugene Bible College, I went to, a few years ago, I went to Eugene Bible College, which isn't that anymore, but anyway, um, when I was in my freshman year, this guy was very outgoing, right? And I go, oh, they're going to elect him for class president, you know, they're going to elect him for that. And sure enough, they elected him for class president, and he didn't last no more than three months at the school and got kicked out, <laughs> it's never there again. So, oh, yeah. so, see, I'm saying the people judge by the outward appearance like that. And that wasn't right. I, you know, I could tell it was a, he was phony baloney. And I mean, I go, what are you guys doing? Electing him, he's not going to work out. And three months later, he's kicked out of school. He can't even keep up his grades or anything. And so I, I kind of saw that ahead of time, that train wreck ready, ready to happen. But I guess nobody else did. But I guess because I was a little bit older, probably I'm a little wiser in my. So what they say, you get a little wiser in your older age? Or you're. you're <laughs> <laughs> uh, finding, okay, we'll go back to Kevin again. Finding your purpose is finding your essence or calling in life, not just adopting the belief of someone else. We just can't adopt somebody else's belief. God's got a purpose for you, uniquely you. You know, um, just don't adopt somebody else's belief system. I mean, that could be all whacked out, you know. I mean, we could, go, we could go have a train wreck there, couldn't we? Yep. <laughs> I mean, God wired you for a certain reason and a certain way of doing things. Yeah. And don't follow somebody else's belief system, okay? <laughs> but I'm, I, you know, that, I mean, that's, I, I've done that before. That just, I'm just speaking from experience. And everything I speak from a lot of times is from my own experience. I wish I learned some things along the way which, from the school of hard knocks sometimes, you know? Uh, that's how I learned a lot of things from the 
that. Uh, it's about finding yourself along with God. So it's like a little journey that we go on with God, that we're finding ourselves and God. And we're working together. Um, and that's what, what it's all about is our purpose. And then 2 Corinthians, let's turn there real quick. i got to hurry up. I'm, I haven't got it on my first point yet. <laughs> oh, boy. I used to have a hard time uh, just going through my notes really fast, but I'm getting long-winded now. Is that a good thing or bad? I don't know. 2 Corinthians 5. Second Corinthians 5, 5 through 10. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home or in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due from him the things done well in the body, whether good or bad. Uh, the key point is um, verse 5. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose. God has made us for this very purpose. In, this, in the Greek, the Christ prepared us for this very purpose. It means he gave us a Holy Spirit as a deposit. And the deposit, in this context, it always applies as an act which engages, engages to something that's bigger. So something else is bigger when he deposits those things in us, engages us in something bigger. And the guarantee is an assurance for the fulfillment of a condition. So we have an assurance. What do you think about when you think of guarantee? You're guaranteed something. You like that, don't you? When you're guaranteed 100% money back guarantee. Did I say it right? Should I say it with more withdrawal? 100% guarantee. <laughs> How about that? Is that better? <laughs> I didn't either. <laughs> I, was, um, <laughs> I got myself laughing. I laughed. Like, <laughs> um, and then confident. How do you like to be confident? I love to be confident. That's something I always lacked in my life. Well, lacked in my life is confidence. You know, that's really, I can really debil debilitating is confidence. If you're not confident in something, how can you do something if you're not confident in it? Um, I was thinking back when I was, a couple years ago when I was working in the hospital as a chaplain, and they didn't train us real well in the, in the uh, ER room, the emergency room, and you get called in and you're alone, and they didn't really train you real well, and you're like, how, what am I, yeah, what am I doing here? <laughs> you know, because you know, they just tell you kind of sort of what you're supposed to do, but then you lack your confidence because you're not sure what you're supposed to do because you don't know the protocol sometimes. Each situation is different, you know? Uh, so you're not really sure. So sometimes you're, you're confident it gets lacked in there because you're not sure what I'm doing. So that's kind of like that same thing. It's kind of like a salesman too. You know, a salesman, the way he builds up his confidence is to believe the product that he's selling. You know, a salesman just doesn't go in and tries to sell you a product that he's not familiar with. He's very familiar with that product and he knows that product inside and out. And so he's very confident that he's going to sell you that product. You know, they, they, you see what I'm saying? Um, so we got to have that confidence in us as well. That's what purpose is about. That's what verse 6 is talking about. It has a basic sense of to dare, to be bold, and hence to be of good courage. That's the ideal in the Greek in that one, in confidence. So it has a, we have to be, to dare, to be bold. I want to be bold. And then the second point is vision. This is the vehicle you used. Now, we got, now we're getting into the vehicle. We're getting ready to drive, okay, guys? We've got to have a vision now. We're going somewhere. Um, let's look at Exodus 32.25. This is a real good example of bad leadership. This is kind of a familiar story. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Exodus 32.25. Oh, I'm in the wrong place. Here. Thirty-two. 
Okay, you've got it all? Okay. Moses saw that the people were running wild and that Aaron had let them go out of control and so became a laughingstock to their enemies. So he stood at the entrance of the camp and said, whoever is for the Lord, come to me and I'll leave this rally to him. This is that story where, uh, Mo, uh, I mean, not Moses, I mean, Aaron built a golden calf and Moses was up there getting the, the, um, the tablets and he came down and Aaron made a muck of everything and uh, was running wild. Bad leadership on Aaron's part. You know, he listened to the people. And I want to demonstrate something. I need about four people just to come up here real quickly. Don't worry, I'm not going to hurt anybody. At least not yet. Just need about three or four people. I need a couple more if you're okay, good. Good, good, good. One more. I'll, I'll uh, pull you out if you don't come up. Want to come here, I told you I wasn't going to do this, but I guess I will now. Okay, guys, make a line. No, like this, like a lunch line. Like, come on me. No, you're terrible. There you go. Like a there you go. We're going to play follow the leader. Have you guys played follow the leader before? Okay, we're going to follow the leader. Are we ready, guys? Okay, let's follow the leader here. All right, we're following the leader here. Got to follow the leader. Okay, I'm going to go back this way, guys. Oh, it's a little small space over here to follow the leader. And then all of a sudden... I lost my vision and my passion and all that stuff, you know? And what happens to you guys when I lose my vision? What are you guys doing? What, are you, what happens to you guys? Huh? Nothing. What are you guys going to do? Build a calf? Or what are you going to do? You're going to go wild, abandonment? Are you going to run away? <laughs> so you, you guys just got to go scattered all over the place and I'm trying to reel you back in. So you guys are, you guys are obedient, though. You guys still stay here. <laughs> you guys are no fun. All right, thank you, guys. These guys are good. They, they, they stayed in place. Good sheep. Usually the sheep will scatter all over the place. <laughs> but see what I'm saying, though, is that all of a sudden I stop. I don't have a... I'm leading... <laughs> what was that? All of a sudden I'm leading people and I lose my vision or whatever, and people start scattering all over the place. That's kind of what happened here in this story with Aaron. You know, he was leading... He wasn't leading, actually. <laughs> he was given in to what the people wanted. The people got worried. Where's Moses at? You know, where did Moses go? And, and then people said, told him, Aaron, let's just craft, uh, just give me all your gold, and we'll just make something so we can worship something. And that's what happened. And I like, I like how it says that they went wild. They went out of control. And boy, that must have been quite something to see. <laughs> So without vision, people become wild. Unrestrained comes from the Hebrew word root to let go or let alone. So we're just letting people be alone, letting them go. That's not a good thing as a leader. As a leader, you got to lead. I remember when I, um, some of you are familiar with uh, Royal Rangers, which is part of Assembly of God. And I was being trained, because I grew up in Royal, uh, Royal Rangers as a kid. You know, It's like a Boy Scout type thing is what it is. Um, for kids. And so as I got old enough, I was able to lead it when I got older, in my early 20s. And we were being trained. And one of the things that always stuck with me as in, in my training was that you always got to be prepared for these boys. If you're not prepared, they will entertain you. <laughs> and so I had, as a leader, I had to make sure I had something going on. Otherwise, they would entertain me. And then I would lose control of the class. And so that's something that always stuck with me to remember that I can lose control of this class if I didn't have something prepared. If I didn't have a vision or I didn't have something going on, I would lose control of this class. And, and it's true, too. Boys are that way. Yes, yes. I have a, I have a busload of boys. I understand that. <laughs> it's, it's quite entertaining at times. Um, so leaving people up to their own devices is bad leadership, okay? Bad leadership, bad. Leaders lead, they don't let people run wild. We, don't, we need to catch the vision of God, is what we need to do. Whose vision are you catching, yours or God's? It's about God's vision, and we need to learn to follow his vision. So sometimes we want to make sure, stop, take a moment, and see and reflect, whose vision am I doing? Whose vision is this? Some characteristics of a God-given vision. The vision won't go away. 
The vision doesn't change, even when circumstances do. The vision is confirmed and directed by God through people. The vision brings confidence and endurance, and the vision brings motivation and dedication. Those are some of the things to look at, uh, characteristics of a God-given vision. The main one, I think, is the vision won't go away. It won't leave you alone. It'll keep coming at you. Urgh. No. <laughs> It'll just keep coming at you. I mean, I... I uh, <laughs> but um, I lost my train. I thought my wife would be laughing over here. <laughs> she needs to stop that. Uh, so the vision won't go away. It won't leave you alone. It'll just keep coming up. And you know that's a God-given vision when things just keep coming up the same way. You know, he might even give you a dream at night about it. You know, or, you know, you got to wake up sometime and look at it. What God is trying to say to you. You know. Have you ever had a have you ever had this vision and motivation and dedication? Have you ever experienced that? You know, when you know you're doing something right for God, don't you ever don't you feel that excitement that this is the right way that God wants me to go? Yes. Amen. I know for me that's the way it is. I know when I first moved down here, though, I wasn't too sure if this was the direction God wanted me to go or not. Oh, my goodness gracious. You name it, anything went wrong, went wrong down, when I moved down here to go to school. Um, and within a few months, I realized that God wanted me here. Uh, we didn't have, my wife was supposed to have a job. Uh, it, didn't, it fell through. We didn't have no job. We needed money. Money came in. We didn't have food. It was clear, close to Thanksgiving time. God gave us, I think it was for Thanksgiving, th three food boxes we didn't know about. Um, and then Christmas happened the same thing, and then somebody gave us some more money during Christmas, I believe, as well, and then some more food boxes. And we had to start giving food away because we had so much food. <laughs> okay, I, well, okay, God, I give up. This is the direction you really want me to go, you know. Um, but at first, I was like so frustrated. I wanted to move back to Portland and say, forget it. You know, I said, forget it. You don't really want me here, do you? I mean, it was just a pain moving down here. Uh, I almost got, after I got done moving, it was like 95, and I only had one other person help me move. And I got a heat stroke. I, got, I was hucking by the time I was done, by the time I was move, done moving. Oh, man, I, almost, I was going to end up in the hospital. And <laughs> I go, God, is this really where you want me at, you know? Um, but see, I had to go through that, and I know God, this is where God wants me at now. Just had to go through some difficult time there. So God gives you a passion to pursue the vision. Uh, this is, um, that's the vehicle. And fulfill it even when it, when it seems a hopeless dream and an exercise in futility. Your faith and endurance will be tried and tested by, as, a, as by a refiner's fire. While you still have the prerogative to turn away once you are brought into the vision with, your, with all your heart, you probably will not even consider the possibility of ending the pursuit. Along the way, your desire to fill, fulfill the vision becomes fused with God's desire to bring it to pass in your life. Catching God's vision is, for ministry is one of the most motivating mysteries and challenging experiences that can ever happen. I think that's so true. I think that's, I have some good points in there. Your faith and endurance will be tried and tested by a refiner's fire. You'll be tested. I mean, I, how many of you like to be tested? I don't like test period anyway, but... I don't like tests. But things will be, you'll be tested. You'll be going through stuff, heartaches. And so the 10 most wanted men or women looks like this. The man or woman who puts God's business above any other business. The man or woman who brings his children to church rather than sends them, then sends them. The man or woman who's willing to be the right example to every boy or girl he meets young person, I could say. The man or woman who thinks more of his Sunday school class than he does his Sunday sleep. Or we could say church. I love my Sunday sleep though, but hey, I could do that later after church, okay? I could take a nap. It's hard though when football's on though, man. No, I'm just kidding. The man or woman who measures his giving by what he has left rather than by the amount he gives. The man or woman who gives to the church for Christ's sake rather than for himself or someone else. The man who has passion to help, man or woman who has passion to help rather than to be helped. The man or woman who can't see his own faults before his faults of others. That's important to think about, isn't it? You know, think about others before you think about yourself. That's so powerful. 
Sometimes we so focus on ourselves and forget about others. Uh, and then also the man or woman who stands firm in his convictions based on the word of God, i.e., a, big, a backbone Christian. You've got to have a backbone to be a Christian. It's not easy to be a Christian. It's probably really tough to be a Christian. I used to look, when I was in my early 20s, I used to look, I was, grew, grew, up, grew up in church. And that's kind of my pivotal point, 19 or 20, and I began to look back and look forward. I looked at where I came from, from with the Lord, but I looked forward to where everybody else looked like they were having fun, partying and all that. That looked more like fun, but I found out that wasn't fun. And so I found out that I have to have a backbone. I can't just look and give in to those passions and desires that are wrong. So I've got to have a backbone. Or the man or woman who is more concerned about winning souls for Christ than he is about winning honor. Passion is an intense drive to do something. Amen? Yeah. Passion is an intense drive to do something. You've got to do something. That's the passion. We all got to have a passion to do something. If you don't have that passion, then you're not going anywhere. You're going to be stuck in the mud. Stuck. Um. So, in so in conclusion, I want us to say this prayer out loud. I don't know if my should put that. Up. Yeah, let's say this prayer out loud. Set us afire, Lord. Stir us, we pray. While the word perishes, we go our purposeless, passionless what day after day. Set us afire, Lord. Stir us, we pray. I love that prayer. I just didn't know an author, but I love the prayer, though. Stir us, Lord. Have passion. Stir that fire in us, Lord. Stir that fire in us. So the purpose is the direction we're headed. Uh, vision is the vehicle we use. And passion is what drives the vehicle. Passion is what drives that vehicle. Amen? If we don't, if we don't know where our vehicle's going, and if we don't know what kind of vehicle we're driving, then we don't have no passion. You've got to have some passion, all right? Let's just pray, and um, then I'll let the pastor. Lord, I just thank you this night, Lord, that, Lord, just give us that desires of our heart, Lord. Lord, that you called us all uniquely in ministry, Lord. And Lord, let us fulfill that uniqueness in ministry, Lord. Lord, let us walk in your anointing as well, Lord, as we've discovered this ministry, Lord, that you called us into. Challenge our hearts tonight, Lord, to, to be a people, Lord, that have purpose and people that have vision and a people that walk in passion. And Lord, that we be people of you, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen.